Hey guys, I'm Mackenzie. I'm a tech reporter at CNBC. Thrilled to be with you. So impressed that you're here this early. Um, we're going to actually start off with Joaquim from the European Commission. He's in Florence. He has a 10 minute presentation to kind of set up the topic. So I'm going to leave it to him to begin and then we'll open it up to a panel to have a discussion on self policing uh, in the world of DeFi. So thank you so much. And Joaquim, please kick us off. Thanks so, Thanks much, so much for the for kind introduction. Kind of <clears throat> and thanks very much for having me here. Uh, I hope that you can see me. I can hear you and I can see me, but I can't see the room, but should work out fine. Uh, I have seen your absolutely exciting program yesterday and today. Oh, now I see me. Excellent. And uh, therefore, I'm very happy to join you in Florence, uh, where we have a big conference on blockchain for the internal market in the European Union today. I'm sitting here actually in the Machiavelli room. And that should perhaps tell us something. Uh, this is the University, uh, the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them that they have provided me with this. And this year is the very city where Machiavelli was born and also died nearly 500 years ago. Now, I had hoped that they had a portrait of him behind me, but this is just some modern art, so we just have to visualize him a little bit. And I don't know what you know about him, but he's a very important connection between ancient times and the medieval times on the one hand side, and very modern interpretation of society and politics right now. Right. And if there's perhaps one thing to uh, remark, it is that you can be as nice, as good as you want, but the world outside is not as nice and as good as you probably are. There are dark forces out there, people have their interests, not always very positive ones, and we have to accommodate them for that. So, so develop a little bit on that, my function and that is the economist in the unit responsible for the digital transformation in digital of the European Commission. And I've been dealing with blockchain for a very long time, and I have a couple of insights from my perspective and have it here. Now, first of all, speaking of the dark horse of the light, if I'm speaking of light and shadow, we are the light. We are the good ones. We are those that bring benefits and merits to the whole society. This is something which goes much deeper than crypto, much deeper than DeFi, much deeper than any individual application. The whole crypto blockchain, as you know, has long history behind it, but basically emerged during the financial crisis 2008-2009. And this was the moment where the legacy system had the moment of its biggest slump, the exposure of risks from those that affected whole economies and of course all the people. And decentralized bottom-up solutions are a very important, if not the most important part of solving the problems of the centralized system. And I'm talking from a public policy perspective, not only to have some nice words to you, but we in Europe have demonstrated that since then, since the financial crisis, and I was involved at the time in all the bank savings, the bank rescues, um, in various matters, not only in the NICA regulation. We have been working from the very beginning to understand, to learn what are the opportunities created by blockchain as a technology and by the applications in every field. We have in 2015, that is nearly seven years after we had the first cryptocurrency, at the highest political level, from the president of the European Commission, declared that blockchain is one of our breakthrough technologies where we bet our future in Europe on it. We have four key points for Europe, and this includes blockchain. And we are not only talking. In the field of finance, we have, as you know very well, just launched the Mika regulation, which is, in our opinion, a very liberal piece of regulation, especially if you look at how we treat utility tokens, and also in terms of what we exclude. For example, we exclude DeFi, we exclude DAOs, we exclude the real economy applications of NFTs, and in my opinion, NFTs in general. And this, and this is not because, because we don't understand that, but because we think that the opportunities by far outweigh the risk. So, so if we take a risk-based risk approach, approach, there's no need to right now regulate it, but we have to work with the innovators to develop this. And in the real economy, we're also not only talking, 
because we are already building during the past five years large scale decentralized open source blockchain infrastructures, for example, to detect counterfeit products. So this involves the uh, following of the path of a product or a service from the source to the end consumer. With the digital twin, we use NFTs for the exchange of information throughout the journey, and the data is validated in my blockchain. This will be operational in the next two years. We are already testing it, and it's only one example of what we do. This whole decentralized space is not talk. This whole decentralized space is a reality, and we have at the moment, as you know, coming to the end of our current mandate, no part from learning and discussing the topics to go at this moment further with the regulation for good reasons that I've just mentioned. Now, this was the nice part. The less nice part, perhaps, is that we have some homework to do. Let me look at traffic now being here at the moment in Italy. When you are a car driver in Germany and you see a potential risk coming up, what you do is you jump on the brake. What they do with all your respect to my Italian friends when they're driving a car and they're seeing a potential risk, they blow the horn so that people can hear you, but they don't reduce the speed. Now, now there might be better ways to proceed, but if I take the analogy to the technology, we know that blockchain cannot be slowed down. Quite to the contrary, it is, and I'm an economic historian, the fastest path of innovation that I have ever seen in history, and that is exemplified by what I just seven years after the emergence of the Bitcoin white paper that we had declared it as the innovation. So it's not always a good idea to jump on the brake, and it's not always feasible to jump on the brake. But it's also not sufficient to blow the horn. There are many other possibilities that people are working in the DeFi space, and I've checked out your program, especially today. You have fantastic next presentations coming up on the applications and the next technological steps. But I can guarantee you that in the political space, especially in Brussels, no one understands what you're talking about. We already had the problem with media transfer of funds and the other regulations that from more than 700 members of the UK Parliament, there's exactly 1%, 7 that have a fairly good idea of what you are talking about. If I look at what you have in your program today, there is no one who understands that. And that is a big problem because all of these people might vote as of next year when we have a new European Parliament, when we have a new European Commission with a new five-year plan on perhaps a follow-up to Mika and everything else, that they might come up with a regulation on DeFi and then regulate. Of course, you can escape, escape and, and, and I personally find that a positive, positive thing to do because, because we need to have that move towards the most extensive decentralization that is possible, possible only to show the legacy system, system that you cannot prevent this from happening, as has, has been done with other technologies in the past. It cannot be put back into the box. But wrong regulation could severely limit the opportunities that you have to scale and reach out to society. And this is why we feel that you now have a 12 months window of opportunity to discuss with the regulators, with the policy makers, the benefits of what you are doing. This is a lot about communication. This is a lot about showing use cases and helping to design decentralized infrastructures, giving meaningful interpretation to what are DeFi, DAOs, etc. We are working on this. And, and that's the most important part of it, show the very concrete benefits, not for you as a developer, not for you as a dev, not for you as someone working in the space, but for citizens, for small enterprises, of what is the change to your life from what you are doing, because this is the only language that politicians understand and care about. So I'm very happy that we have this panel here this morning. I'm extremely happy that we have this event here in Prague, not only this one, but also everything that is going around here. And I would see this as an invitation to have a very open and constructive discussion. We want to support you. We think that you are very, very important and getting more important by the day. But you have to help us develop the storyline to convince the politicians that indeed you can have meaningful regulation of problem. Thank you, Joaquin, for that very comprehensive and helpful introduction to the topic that we're dealing with today. 
You know, you mentioned that the work on legislation thus far has excluded DeFi and DAOs, and I wonder if we almost just start the panel with that, because there is this misunderstanding that the world of CeFi and DeFi are the same thing. I think that mainstream uh, media's understanding of the space often conflates the two, and we are with Mika, this like, comprehensive framework that was just released, um, that was just approved, will actually go into action in the next 12 to 18 months is squarely focused on the intermediaries, that CFI space. So, uh, Tomas, I almost wonder if you can kind of set us up with this understanding of what has, what, what do we have hard and fast rules about in the CFI space versus DeFi? Let's just, let's just set up that and then go from there. Thanks, McKinsey. Yeah, uh, so first of all, um, as Joachim said, it, it is a journey, and if you start regulation in that space, uh, you, you really have to educate yourself first. And this dialogue, actually, uh, Joachim uh, invited you to start with, with regulators uh, is a crucial one. And uh, if you don't have like the, the understanding and the knowledge uh, as a regulator what this really is, the problem is you might end up with really a wrong approach to regulation. And um, we have that experience in Liechtenstein. I was uh, a member of the work group of the Liechtenstein government uh, to, to, uh, to, to come up with regulation in Liechtenstein, which we have enforced since 2020, and it's a, it's a very comprehensive one. Um, but we also asked us the question, we said, okay, what is really different when you use that technology? And um, we identified, and, and it took us a lot of time to understand what is really different. Um, and so that's why we, we defined a, a new thing which we call trustworthy technologies. And our approach, I don't want to talk too much about that, but um, I, actually this brings us to your question. Um, you have to understand that this technology, as a regulator, you have to understand that this technology is capable of addressing risks uh, which we normally address with regulating intermediaries, right? So if, because the demand of consumers did not change, you want to buy an asset, you want to actually sell an asset, you want to find a counterparty to keep the example simple. But the thing is, if you organize that in a very traditional way, you do that by an intermediary, right? And the intermediary, they, because they have this information, they, they have this access to this central system, they could, they could do a lot of bad things with that, right? And uh, so you come up with regulation and say, look, I mean, we have to regulate you as an intermediary. You have to be fit and proper. You have to follow all of these rules. We will send you auditors every year. We will, we will do reports. And they're, they're so that, that's how we regulate the space. So with this new technology, you have the same solution. You find a counterparty. You actually interact with each other without intermediaries based on the technology. And if the technology works well, there's no need for regulation. But to understand that, and that is the challenge that takes time, and not, and if we are really truly uh, true to ourselves, whatever we call DeFi, right? There is true DeFi, there is true DeFi in my understanding, there is CeFi, there is true DeFi, and there's a lot in the middle, which is a little bit of CeFi, a little bit of DeFi, and that there comes the challenge because we market ourselves as an industry and say, look, this is truly DeFi. We don't need regulation. And then we say, yeah, you know, to give you the example of, of, of a DEX, yeah, but the order book is actually very centralized or the, we have liquidity pools, which are, well, we, we, we are not 100% sure about that. So th th that is the problem, right? So we came up with, uh, with, the, with the understanding and said, look, there is a momentum and, 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 and a room where you need to regulate a central custodian, right? If you custody tokens for someone else, that's that's nothing different from, from the traditional world. But if we do it differently, if we allow for self-custody, yeah, we, we, we might not need regulation. And there, there, there is the challenge, right? There, there is the challenge that we need to, to have this dialogue with the regulator that they understand the difference. And we have to be true to ourselves as well. Just don't use a marketing term and tell, tell everybody it's DeFi. It's not. We have to find a common understanding what DeFi really is, what is true DeFi, and where do we need to regulate and where not. And, and Jan, I want to talk to you more on this point. Just, the, you know, we backstage were having a conversation about a lot of the breaches that we saw in 2021, and Jan was making the point that a lot of people confuse the fact that these are more centralized intermediaries. So maybe that gray zone or on the CeFi side of things rather than DeFi. And I wonder if you can kind of talk about some of the nuances there. Yeah, thank you, Mackenzie. This is exactly uh, how Joachim pointed out. Uh, the fact that uh, the Mika uh, doesn't apply on, uh, on uh, DeFi, that doesn't mean at all that there are no rules. From the regulator's perspective, it's exactly, it can be, uh, let's say, quite troublesome. Uh, they need to decide what is DeFi, what is not. But 
just look at it from the perspective of your partners, of your clients, of the normal people, <laughs> to say so. They need some, uh, they need some comfort zone. They need to know that uh, we are, uh, you know, applying some ground rules like anti-money laundering. And I'm not talking about banks. I'm talking about the usual guys, you know, like uh, usual companies you want to work with, you want to serve, you know, with DeFi because this industry is not just to serve itself. Uh, this industry is going for mass adoption, and to be in mass adoption uh, mode, you need some uh, to provide what we lawyers uh, call usually the legal certainty. But it's not just for the regulators. And the Mackenzie mentioned the, these breaches. Yeah, no one uh, distinguish, and no one can actually, from let's say the general public, distinguish between the. Uh, centralized, uh, centralized, let's say, bad actors and decentralized bad actors. We need to earn the trust uh, from the public, basically from the clients. They are going to pay the money and uh, they are going to, to trust us with the money. That, that's it. And, you know, uh, and, and uh, Joaquin, I want you to chime in as well, but uh, uh, Tomas, I'm going to go to you first. You mentioned that Liechtenstein has had this very unique approach and has kind of gone beyond what we've seen out of Brussels and, and has, has attempted to navigate and regulate around the world of DeFi. Can, can you talk a little bit more about what you guys have been working on? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, we started 2016 and uh, we created this vision of the token economy and uh, we said it's way more than regulating intermediaries. So we, we identified, actually we, we came from the, uh, the belief that uh, we will, we will uh, live in a tokenized world where we will have more and more assets uh, tokenized. We will see more and more of this technology being used in our daily transactions in the way how our economy works. So we also came up with uh, a civil law framework for tokenization of assets uh, to, to create this legal certainty if you transfer a token, also the represented right is transferred, uh, how, how identity is, is dealt with. Uh, so we have a very, very comprehensive and, and broad um, uh, approach to regulation. But with the true, uh, with the understanding that if something is uh, like doesn't need to be regulated, uh, like as I said, truly de DeFi applications, there is no regulation, right? So it, it, it's a very broad approach, and you see now that a lot of um, uh, countries, jurisdictions. And also, like international standard setting boards are thinking about uh, not only regulating the, the, the intermediaries and the supervisory part, but they try to find solution for these digital twins. Uh, they, they they come up with like some some standard rules how, how you can approach uh, these issues. Um, so I, I think, and, and and that is actually something in in that area. It's it's true as everywhere. We should learn from each other, right? Because we had we had challenges. Uh, we, we we also now have a lot of experience in in comparison with this act in force since 2020, and and we can share the lessons learned, right? And 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 we do that, right? So um, it's actually also an invitation to uh, for everybody to have a look at what what we did in Liechtenstein and and to learn from it, because not everything is perfect. We are already working on version two uh, to to address some of the challenges we had. You know, Joachim, you said during your presentation that a lot of people in Brussels don't know what they're talking about. And I, I wonder, as you kind of look beyond Mika, so, you know, perhaps going beyond legislation around the intermediaries to that gray zone that we've been talking about between CFI and DeFi, where there are these hybrid models, like, what, what, how are you guiding your thinking in terms of next steps? What, what comes next out of Brussels um, in terms of dealing with regulation around these hybrid models that kind of go into that gray zone? Mackenzie, let me clarify that when I say that people don't know what they are saying or doing, um, I'm, I'm from a political perspective in a positive way. So on a technical level, you know I think extremely well uh, what we are doing and we have put that out in the open because we have been growing with the space from day one. But of course, we only make proposals and then there is a complex political process involving the European Parliament, but also 27 governments. We have also three more governments, including Liechtenstein, that uh, apply the rules. So you can imagine how complex that is. And everyone who votes on that has on their perspective regarding jobs, security, energy, whatever they have in mind to judge our space through their lens, and this makes it very complicated. They cannot, of course, understand the details. This is why it is so much more important to continue the dialogue, to learn from each other, but also to dive extremely deep into the technology on the one hand side, 
but on the other hand side, to take a coherent perspective. And that for me is the next step. We at this moment do not have a concrete mandate for the next five years that will only come next year with the new work program on the COVID. And given public statement, giving the likelihood that something in this space will have again imploded by then, there is a high likelihood that indeed we will look at this space also from a regulatory perspective. This being said, we cannot watch DeFi alone. DeFi, DAOs, the whole decentralized space is a continuum, and you need to have a horizontal perspective to deal with that. For example, we have we in have Europe the tradition, tradition from our data, data rules to take a very individualistic perspective. perspective. Uh, you know our GDPR. So everyone, everyone owns, owns their data, data and should be the only person to decide who has access to data. data. That is a very decentralized approach. On the other hand side, and that is my opinion, an individual is nothing without a community. Think of yourself. You have a family, you have a Clubs, 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 you have all sorts of communities. A part of the person engages with that community and becomes a part of that community. And for example, the data streams, your identity needs to be confined to that space in order to keep you safe. And this also means that at the end of the day, it is the communities that take jointly decisions and not the individual. Mika is, as Thomas and Jan have rightly said before, is about the intermediaries. In the, in the DeFi, DeFi space, space, if it is real DeFi, 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 as in DAOs, if it is a real DAOs, DAOs you, have you have the collective, collective responsibility for which we do not have a civil law tradition. tradition. So, so look, look, for example, example at DAOs, DAOs, DAOs with one example. One example. We, have we have cooperatives at local level throughout our history, history over the last thousand years and longer. A DAO is nothing new. It is a historical local community. A cooperative that you put into the digital space and the blockchain enables the scaling that has never been possible before. This is the huge potential. But for that, you need to develop rules on how you govern collective spaces also in terms of responsibility. It is my opinion that you cannot take out just a programmer or a coder or just guys that you have to grab responsible for everything that the collective does. If the collective does something, if you enter there at your own discretion, you become part of the opportunities, but also part of the risk. And you should, under normal circumstances, if something goes wrong, not call your prime minister or your regulator to complain. This requires a much more assertive, but also careful approach towards jointly defining what are the limits, what are the benefits, and how can we embed regulation into our activities to be more transparent, not to be controlled from outside worlds, not to be hindered by centralized systems, but to be much more clearer in your communication, in your transparencies on what you can deliver and what not. And if you can do that, that will already help a lot. So I think what we need in the next step to answer your question is to go much deeper in questions of law, but also anthropology, also the ethical questions to develop a horizontal approach to true decentralization that at a certain moment will come. And for those that pretend that are in the DeFi space to understand that even if you are very, very decentralized, you have a smart contract, whatever, that this at the start is always a centralized approach, but that you have to let loose at a certain moment in time and have very clear and good rules in order to have the thing developed for the world. If we can manage that, we are in a very good position when the next regulation comes to have some good arguments. What that will be in detail, we will only see in the second half of next year. So that is the opportunity to be there. I have actually one thing to, to give you a concrete example. Uh, we all know that nothing really started fully decentralized from day one, like nothing. So it's a process, right? And uh, now, if, if if we if we think about to give you the example of a layer one, if you start now a layer one, and uh, I I can share that experience. Um, you start somewhere, and then you come up with a fully with an idea that it's going to be fully decentralized. And if even if you convince the regulator that they buy into that, that it takes time and it's a process, right? Uh, there might be questions like, but ah, how do you do code updates, right? And who has the master key to do that? So there are a lot of questions. And that is what Joachim said. It's, it's, we, we have to dig really deeper and deeper into the technology 
And I mean, I, I used to code software for about 10 years be be before I became a lawyer. Um, and, and, and for me, that is an obvious thing, right? You, I, I want to understand everything before I actually analyze something. Uh, but imagine on the other side of the equation, you have a regulator, maybe hopefully they are, they are, uh, they are legally trained in most cases, uh, but you find rarely um, re regulators which actually can live in both worlds or which have a tech team they actually can talk to. And that is also an invitation to the coders to talk to the, to the legal professionals. And I give you another, an, another reason why. We should learn from each other because I live in both worlds. In, in law, we also try to come up with rules which don't need uh, court cases anymore. So the idea was to have a, a, a very precise rule set, a law, where everything is pretty 100% clear. So if you do something, that's the result. I think for the coders that sounds familiar, right? That didn't help, that didn't work out well, right? It, 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 yes, it's getting better, but we still need courts. And I think we all agree, and that is actually something we pre-discussed a little bit, yes, we do have some challenges with code which we cannot change, right? <laughs> so there, there, there are uh, results which we, which we want to avoid. There are flaws, there are, there are challenges, right? So, um, but, but this is the same, this is exactly the same. Law, uh, like policymakers come up with rules which are not completely auto-executable, right? So you need enforcement and, and, and things, but it, it's not really that different. So I think if we, uh, and that, that's the invitation, let's start to work together more intensely. We do work together since years, but let's incentivize that because it's needed more than ever because if we don't do that now, we will end up having really bad regulation because everybody now, we, we start to regulate somewhere, the CeFi space, the next thing is we need to regulate NFTs, we need to regulate DeFi, we need to regulate everything, right? And if, if we don't do that, if we don't start that dialogue and tell them what our industry is capable of doing, where we can actually add value, where we can solve problems, and Joachim, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard between the lines that you said the solution for, for CeFi is not regulation, it's DeFi. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But at, at, at least that is what I believe long term. But that's a long journey, right? That takes time. And it's not um, that it's we do the kill switch tomorrow and then we will have another solution. It's a process. And it, within the process, coming back to the original topic, self-regulation uh, might be a very good solution. Let me just uh, disagree with you, Thomas, on one thing. This is not an invitation. This is, this is you know, the only thing the industry can do because uh, the next step is not uh, on the side of the regulators. The next step is on the side of the industry. Uh, well, just uh, if you all probably remember uh, 2019 and all the heated discussions about Libra, uh, the Facebook failed stablecoin, right? So I remember especially one hearing uh, in New York's Office of the Security Exchange Commission, uh, and actually they were clueless, they were helpless, and uh, you know, like a little bit afraid. So should we be surprised by what is happening now in the US? No, absolutely not. Is it like, uh, you know, the good approach to industry? Of course, of course not. But we need to listen to, to the guys on the other side. We need to listen to, to Joachim, he's actually not on the other side. <laughs> but uh, then, you know, for uh, in Europe, uh, well, that was much more sensible approach. Uh, we got Mika. Um, and I heard from all the guys, like, you know, big uh, exchanges, like, oh, we don't care, like two years ago. No, we are going to Bahamas. That's, that, that's fine. Then, like, half a year ago, everyone came to me and said, hey, there's a Mika. We need to do something about it. But, guys, the Mika was uh, actually done uh, almost a year ago, exactly on the 30th of June at 23.35, uh, just uh, before the midnight, uh, it was the text was done. So uh, now, and uh, I know Mackenzie uh, asked us before, what what are the lessons to be learned? Well, the first lesson is to listen to the guys, like uh, to the regulators. Second, uh, we should not definitely wait uh, for them to move the next step. And uh, third, it's our it's our time to to uh, do the next step. And what can we do? Well, we should send the standards, the industry standards. We should say, okay, this is the industry standard. 
We don't need a regulator for that. We can say, okay, uh, this is the standard of transparency. This is uh, the standard of, uh, of the governance of the DAO. And yes, let's talk about the 2 DeFi. Uh, why not? We can do that. Uh, so everyone can be, can, can be sure that uh, if uh, any, any, any DeFi application, any DeFi protocol uh, is actually following the standard, that's fine. If not, yeah, there's probably a red flag. That's the, that's, the, that's the minimum we can do as an industry. Then the regulators will see, hey, these guys are doing something. They really want to be legit. They really want to, to do something. And the, the partners, either financial institutions or you know, uh, traditional industries can say, hey, this is, this is something, there is something going on. They, these guys are legit. They are, uh, they are playing by the rules. That's, that's an important thing, to play by the rules. But we are in the position to set the rules. So that's basically, that's basically the main message for me today. We are here to set the rules for the DeFi. We don't have to wait for anyone in the US, in the EU, anywhere else. And I'm a simple guy. Um, so if, if I would sit in the audience, I would say, yeah, but I don't know Joachim in person. Like personally, I don't have his email address. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's, it's a nonprofit association called Inatpa. The logo is what was there before, uh, where Jan is a, is a board member, where Bara is in the executive team, and where I'm also in the board, I'm, and I'm, I have the honor to chair the board. It's a nonprofit association. Talk to us. And uh, we are actually creating that dialogue to regulators. That's the stop of, of uh, marketing of Inatpa. <laughs> you know, Jan, you mentioned what we're seeing in the U.S. right now, and this in particular has been uh, quite a charged week with the SEC coming out with suits against both Binance and Coinbase. A lot of people feel as though this regulation by enforcement approach that we've seen in the U.S. in the last few years is the exact opposite to what you should be doing and, and dealing with the space. A lot of people have pointed to uh, Mika in particular as an example of progressive ways to proactively work with practitioners. Joaquin mentioned the fact that he does work with top innovators in the space so that they're making informed decisions in the way that they build out these guardrails. And I, I guess, you know, one thing that I, I think about, I have a couple questions out of this. Like one, how do you not stifle innovation as you create rules around it, whether that's from the policymaker side, uh, you know, the, on the, the legal nuances, self-regulation. It seems like this very delicate balance between creating Sound guardrails and then not letting innovation prosper. I, I guess so. How do you, how do you navigate that? May I take that because we have that experience. When we imagine, like Liechtenstein is a very small country, and we had some um, blockchain actually companies already there in 2016. We had um, ICOs and 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 uh, so. We, we started to think about regulation, and that was one of the questions. If we start as one of the first ones, like nobody will come back to our country anymore, right? Like everybody would say, like, why should I do that in Liechtenstein? Le uh, Switzerland is next door, or Austria is next door. There is not regulated. Why should I go there? But um, actually, what you do is when you create, and that's our actually experience, is if you come up with a sensible approach and a balanced approach, yes, it might be more challenging for them. It might, might take more, it's costly. But then on the other hand, like, what if you are financed by an investor, right? They think about risks. And legal risks are always something they care about, right? And if you can tell them, look, this is the rule set. If we follow these rules, they're fine with it. And I think it's the, these are the two different approaches, completely different approaches, I think, where you come up with a rule set. And this is not possible everywhere. I remember that Joachim also uh, said, it's uh, sometimes we are just too slow, right? It's it, it's 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 challenging. Um, on the other hand, this gives you this legal certainty we need, and we saw that a lot of uh, these companies actually welcomed that regulation if they if it is sensible, if you listen to the industry, if you if you regulate it properly, um, and if it's not too much of a burden to do that. If you scrutinize them, yeah, it, that's different, right? And. That's good. I think on the other hand, what you said is actually more of the, like, you can also think of the Silicon Valley approach, just do it and ask for forgiveness later. Um, the question is, what are the consequences, right? If you are then out of business because of that, then I think the consequences are just too high. If you pay for litigation and maybe are fine, right? Um, yeah, that, that might be different. But uh, I, I truly believe that uh, the approach that uh, if you are a, a central intermediary, even if you have a, a balanced approach in combination with a self-regulation, 
approach where the industry comes up with standards uh, is the way forward. And we will evolve throughout the process, but it takes time. And the last thing I'm going to say is it is a filter function. If you have a sensible regulation, the guys who don't want to comply with the rules, they do it somewhere else. I want to hear from both other panelists. Just one quick aside. You mentioned Switzerland. Um, I, I also think of the UK. I've been speaking to a lot of crypto firms that say that, yes, while there are stringent rules in these jurisdictions, they're just so hungry for clarity. And it's OK if it's <laughs> if it's stricter. They just want to know what the ground rules are going into it. But Jan? That was exactly my point. And before we ask uh, Joachim how to do that, because he's actually the only one here uh, you know, in the position to, <laughs> to, to say. Uh, well, the, the, the answer is to keep it simple and clear. Uh, when I moved to the US uh, with, a, with a fintech startup, we applied for the license. Just a simple, you know, starting one. There are five, and you know it, McKenzie, but there are five regulators, guys. And you need to get a license in 51 states. I'm not kidding. Uh, so that's a nightmare. You are going to pay to lawyers like a lot of money. So, so just keep it simple. You need, uh, I, I can't even remember the names of all the five regulators. So, you know, just to have a one single point of entry and ever, actually as a regulator, you can, uh, if, if you have a law for that, you can ask for anything, but it should be simple, it should be clear, and actually it should be like um, fair to use this, to use this word. It's, it's, it's quite vague, but it should be fair. And then everyone can play by the rules. But the case rule is basically the one that should apply. Allow me one sentence. And uh, don't get us wrong. We don't think that this approach or that approach from any other jurisdictions is bad or, or, or whatever. I think we should lead by a good example. And we should actually come up with a solution which is sensible uh, in the hope that others will follow that, right? Um, and. Uh, in Brussels, we, we, we talk about the Brussels effect, or we call it the Brussels effect, we, which we had with GDPR. Um, I think if Mika would have such an effect, because it is a very well thought through regulation, um, it, 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 it understands the difference between securities and crypto assets, it excludes DeFi, as, as Joachim said. So I, I think um, that that's actually something we should, we should work on, that uh, it's uh, used by others. And Joachim, any other comments you wanted to add on this? I think I that think Machiavelli, Machiavelli combined my thoughts. I lost five. It was very good, very good, 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 good that I didn't have to reply on what you just uh, made enough comments on that. The thing is, just to add to what Thomas and Jan have been saying, you should not underestimate what is in the background together with this industry. Nika was actually the largest part ready much earlier, even a year before Libra came about, because it was a clear idea that they need to proactively design some rules at the right moment to launch them. At this moment, we are very active at looking at the DeFi space and discussing these things, but regulation should always come last. There are enough possibilities to influence the space as we have been discussing here uh, today. And I think, I think that, that um, this, this merits the attention first before we really move to the full-fledged regulation, because regulation is something that the end result will always be something different from what you put in, in, in this uh, discussion. And this is, I would say, why this is also more important. Inapa, as Representative Jan, is playing an active role in this. There are others also that uh, work on the dialogue. We are having a lot of technical discussions of demonstration effects, of uh, learning experiences and, and workshops to really understand what is going on at this moment, especially regarding privacy, regarding, for example, the interfaces, the roles of oracles, but also how we can really ensure decentralization where I would, I would say certain things have happened in the industry for, for good arguments, arguments not necessarily prone to move forward to what's more decentralization, especially if you not only look at the governance, but also at the provision of resources, who is running the nodes, who is providing inputs, uh, who is in control. All of these are very, very important questions where we think that the industry is best advised to come to conclusions and to control first, as we have been discussing here, and then really force us, if there is a political push from top, to only come in with regulation, there's really no other way. Uh, and this is happening right now, this discussion. So why we will only know 
idea of what we will be doing concretely. Of course, we are now putting all the Lego blocks and builder blocks together to have our storyline. And this is why actually uh, this event today, uh, the very active role of Thomas and Jan and everyone in the room is so important in that respect. You know, before I open up this conversation to audience questions, something that I've been thinking about and, and something that we were also discussing ahead of this chat is the fact that the, the risks with AML and KYC standards is that it's not easily solved with tech. Now, people have been working on uh, digital identities and other ways to kind of solve for this problem. But how do, what happens in that space, especially as you, as you start to think about DeFi opening up and becoming more mainstream, bringing in institutional players? What does that look like in practice? Well, actually, the AML is a big thing for everyone. What we need to know, well, three things. First, you can't escape. You can try, you cannot escape. In the end, there will be at least someone, uh, you know, who will be who will be responsible for the AML. Second thing, um, actually, with the, with the Russian invasion to Ukraine, well, the, the world has changed. And everyone is very, very cautious about about the AML. For instance, right now uh, in Germany, and I'm not criticizing Germany in here, just to be clear, but uh, it is easier to uh, be arms trader and to send the money because if you are you, if you are playing by the rules and you have all your documents right, you can do that, uh, and it's legal. And now it's needed, you know, to to, to defend Ukraine, but. Uh, it's almost impossible to have an account, uh, you know, if you're a crypto trader. Uh, you have to, you have to go to really like uh, very much details uh, to to be uh, to be complying with uh, AML. The third thing, and you mentioned the, the uh, self identity, uh, and uh, Joachim mentioned the EPSI, the, the European uh, Blockchain Service project. I've been working on a little bit uh, for the last couple of years. And now there's a huge struggle uh, between, you know, the centralized uh, solutions in Europe for the identity. You probably heard about the digital wallet and uh, and the base, let's say, the solutions based on blockchain. Uh, I personally believe that the one based on blockchain, even though it's a little bit centralized now, that should prevail because it can help us because we can use, we can interoperate with, with these ledgers and we can use the identity. If it stays in uh, just the centralized uh, solutions, that will be quite uh, quite hard. And actually, anyone who tried to uh, get a driver's license here in this country knows what I'm saying, what I'm talking about. Are there any? I mean, I have more questions I could go with, but are there any audience questions uh, that you want to? Anyone want to chime in? I can hand you my microphone if so. Okay. Uh, yeah, please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you so much for the super interesting panel. Uh, I'm going to try to paraphrase a question that uh, came up uh, in a discussion during the build-up to, uh, uh, to this event when we started with the organizational work uh, last year. And uh, it actually ties a little bit to the term that uh, you've, you've actually brought up uh, uh, during, the, during the discussion, which is uh, the true DeFi. So first of all, I would like you to el elaborate a little bit on the definition there, because I think even the, the industry players are not that much aligned on what that actually like, really means. And it, it kind of ties into the second part of the question, which would be, there are some people in the industry uh, uh, who expressed the opinion during the, during the build-up de debates that uh, the true DeFi actually doesn't need to worry about regulation whatsoever because it's unstoppable technically on the on the on the technology level etc cetera, etc cetera. uh kind of like dark web is in, in a in a way uh so i guess uh, i would like you to elaborate on the defi definition and how you uh, then relate to uh regulation of, of true defi i i can i can start here um as i said before when when we started to think about regulation uh we we started with the understanding that there's a technology which allows to do things differently um but then all of these questions start what is really a de decentralized uh, protocol is it like where, where do you start and where do you end is it uh like of with I, I know um, a, f a specific amount of nodes and a specific consensus algorithm um, um, and what is the difference of a 
Excel sheet I upload to a cloud, which is then stored on, on, on several instances, right? Um, so there is, first of all, a lot of research done, like from an academic perspective, what is really truly decentralized from, I can, I can uh, talk about what, what is happening in, in South Korea, they're doing a lot of good work here, but for sure in Europe, we're, we, are, we are working on that as well. I think that's, uh, there is a lot of um, research done in that area, and I think that is also extremely necessary because that comes back to that question. Right? If you uh, talk to a regulator and tell them uh, with through DeFi we don't need regulation, I mean, you, you tell them you cannot regulate because it's unstoppable. Um, I, I just remember one thing. There was this discussion uh, that the, the travel rule um, it should also be applicable when you send a transaction from one wallet to the other wallet. Um, and uh, then, like, the question was, yeah, but how do you implement that, right? I mean, very simple. You implement that in code, and someone is providing that code, so go to that software company, right? So, yes, um, don't underestimate the power of enforcement. Uh, I'm not saying that it's good, but don't underestimate that. Um, so I think the, 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 the approach there is, I would not say it's unstoppable, and that's why you cannot do anything about it. I would say it's unstoppable, and therefore we do we do not have to do anything about it because it works like it should. It addresses the risks. It, it, it it's protecting consumers. It's not possible that the founder of that project is is getting 10% of all of the, the transaction fees or whatever, right? So, I think that should be the argument, and um, that is really the core of the core of the core of the discussion, and that is actually what we should uh, work on, right? These researchers are working on, there is um, academic research, but also the, uh, the work uh, which is done at, at several associations. Um, but I think the industry has to be honest. We have to be honest and not like label something differently. I said that already quite a lot of times. Uh, but I think for me, that is the core question. And as you said, there are, like, you can define a specific, like, it, 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 it's, not, it's not easy to define that what is really decentralized and what is not. Um, but they are, like, we all have some ideas. Thomas, if, young, young. Please. if I may very briefly take a look out in one minute, I have to move to one room further to have to have the next conference, unfortunately. These are two different things. On the one hand side, it's extremely important to have the move towards true DeFi, uh, also as a stick behind the door. Contrary to other technologies, this is nothing that you can prevent and prohibit. This is good, and we must show the legacy system that we can continue and go on, regardless of what we On the other hand side, if we combine this technical opportunity with the attitude that you don't you care, don't care about, about governance, governance issues for how the regulators are you will you probably, probably always find somewhere a whole people on this planet, but it will probably not be a very nice place to be in the long term. It is, in my opinion, a better strategy on the one hand side to work on the space, but on the other hand side to take some standards, not only technical standards, but also governance standards, ethical standards to jointly develop and see how you can really convince people that you want them to join uh, in order to move with you towards this space, leave the benefits and become in the future the legacy system yourself. If I put it like the station we have taken over all this space, we will have all of it. That is out of the discussion that we will have this future, only with the point of perhaps how decentralized might be in theoretical terms, but it will be much more decentralized than it is now. We can go there the hard way, or we can go there the easier way by looking for better communication, by looking for cooperation. And I think the nature of, of decentralization is cooperation. Why create confrontation and create ditches, dig holes and stuff like that? You do not need that in order to have the positive I wish you a very, very productive and fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much for having me discussing here. I'm very sorry for you to not jump in. Yeah, thank you for joining us. But Jan, I'd also love to hear from you on this.
first, uh, thank you, Achim, and enjoy Florence. It will be quite a heated discussion and heated weather there, I guess. Uh, so, uh, as a lawyer, I should say, yes, the definition is the first thing to do. Uh, I, maybe I can surprise you. Uh, I don't care about the definition. The, because there always will be the rules. There are already the rules. Uh, even DeFi uh, has to, let's say, uh, apply. For instance, Mackenzie mentioned the AML KYC. The only question is uh, how to enforce it and who is responsible. So uh, I would say that this approach, I'm sorry to say so, but this approach, and I heard it from a lot of friends working on DeFi uh, applications and protocols. Actually, this is the wrong one, and I can tell you why. Because you are shifting the burden to the little guy. You know, you are shifting the burden to, to anyone, you know, uh, transacting somehow with the DeFi. So you mentioned the darknet. Uh, yes, you, the police or anyone else cannot, cannot you know, uh, really, really uh, get into the darknet. And, and, but they can, for instance, track the packages. So if we don't want the DeFi to become something illegal, something in a, in a, in a gray zone, something like a financial black market, uh, well, we should really uh, get back to what Joachim said, to what, uh, what uh, Thomas said. Actually, uh, and to start uh, to start uh, playing by the rules. And as I said before, let's set the rules first. You know, we have an opportunity to do that. So that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and as you come up, uh, one final question I had. Uh, in terms of this idea of self-regulation and the working groups that you hold to kind of come up with a, uh, with some of those internal policies, what's been the most divisive or contentious issue that comes up? Like, where do you guys disagree internally? Definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no one knows uh, really what the DeFi is now, but uh, no, what what is, what is, uh, jokes aside, yeah, the definition, but then uh, the risks, because first you need to define the risks to know what the measures should be. And uh, actually, if, if you start the list, what risks uh, can any DeFi application or protocol pose to uh, normal people, basically, and their assets, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, that's a long list. Yeah. We're going to end this discussion with one final audience question, uh, please. OK. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so after the GFC, all the regulations that came in centralized banking a lot. So the BIS, the Fed, um, SEC, all of these different banking regulators centralized it a ton. The only uh, entities with enough lawyers to handle it were the massive banks. So globally, we saw a ton of centralization of banking. Consumers had less choices. Um, now you've got the Americans enforcing SECs, you know, like the Howey test, the traditional securities legislation is being applied to anyone who wants to sell crypto to Americans. The UK just came out a couple days ago with new um, guidance on marketing crypto to, for British citizens. The EU has MICA. To me, this is very obviously gonna centralize crypto into entities that only have the, uh, the lawyer capacity or the, or the capacity to deal with all these different um, legal requirements. So how can you say, you know, about setting the rules or creating a playbook um, how can you say that companies need to fall in line with this while also expecting to do anything other than stifle innovation? It's very clear that new projects are not going to be able to start up and comply with EU, UK, USA, Canadian, Australian um, expectations of, of legality. Thank you. Thomas mentioned the, uh, the, MIC, uh, the GDPR effect. So uh, what is the opportunity here is, uh, well, basically Mika will be a global standard in some way. So uh, we hope that we can, let's say, uh, ride this wave. And uh, with uh, Mika going global, uh, we can go global with uh, market standards. That's, that's uh, let's say, the positive, positive uh, side. And uh, let me tell you one thing. Um, there's also one another reason why we can believe this. Uh, the fin fintech or finance industry is the only one that was able to basically uh, the startups from fintech were, were, were able to to go to the US not the other way around you know we can uh, we can uh, remember Evolute at N26 you know going to the US uh, there are no US fintechs actually coming to to the Europe so and uh, every second euro 
uh, was invested like before the COVID in VC cap, in VC uh, investments was invested in Europe in fintech. So I believe that DeFi and, and the crypto industry is the next wave of fintech. So for for the business and political reasons and policy reasons, uh, we believe that we can set the global standard from Europe here. Let me let me actually give you that question back because I think uh, what we said is we don't think that ultimately free regulation is the solution, right? That's not ultimately the solution. The problem is there are only there are some areas where the technology is already there to address this risk properly. But if we look at the vast majority of what we call our industry, it is very centrally organized. So it is a process. And the answer to your question is it, a process takes time and we have steps. And we are now in the step of uh, it was the Wild Wild West. We are now getting regulation. Uh, but the ultimate goal we should collectively together work on is that we have globally an understanding that there is an area where we don't need regulation and we can use the technology and then it should be actually easier for everybody to create the, this future. But it is a process and we also have to be true to ourselves, right? We did not only have very good examples. It's not like that we are co collectively responsible for that, but um, we had we had challenges. And, and, and that is the story. I, I work on that since 20, like I started in 2011. I, I, I work on that since 2016, day to day. And I can tell you it is, it, is, it is challenging and both sides have good arguments and we have to talk to each other to, to make a better future. Thank you so much to the panelists, to the audience members for joining us and to the conference organizers for hosting this discussion. There's so much more to say on the topic, but I think uh, that was a good solid hour. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, McKinsey.